Good day everyone and welcome to another vlog. This week I've got actually quite a few things to discuss. I thought it was going to be a quiet one, but no, nah, actually not. <laughs> um, as you can see we're looking at Aaron, and it's not because of Aaron, because Aaron is finished. Uh, what I want to talk about is the background. Now remember I told you guys a while back that you need to have an uneven contrast to get a more painterly kind of feel like these mountains in the background over here. Now I've gotten a good result with grass, praise God. So I'm quickly going to show you what that looks like and then I'm going to show you how I set it up. Now what you're seeing right now is a music video I finished on Friday last week. Started on Thursday right after the um, vlog was finished and uploaded and all that kind of stuff which took like the whole day. Um, but this was a music video for Away in a Manger and you can see all these dark areas in the grass itself. My dad thinks it's more photo real versus uh, the more painterly kind of look that I'm going for. But I really, really, really like the way that this turned out. So this is the kind of look I want to go for when doing the grass in Egypt. Specifically the like the wheat fields and all that kind of stuff because this technique can be pretty much applied to any grassy field without any issues. So I'm going to quickly show you how to set this up. Okay, so as you can see, this is our little project over here. Now this is not the, the final video project. I just imported the grass so I can focus on that. So this is what it looks like when it's done. And if you turn off the dark areas, it looks like that. Now if this is what you want to go for, that's absolutely fine. You don't have to apply the environment to get the, the right kind of look for it. I'm going to quickly show you what you can achieve even if you don't have the dark areas applied in a full project. Now this was following a tutorial by McLeelan. You can check the link in the description below. The goal with this was purely to reproduce an image that was specifically designed to be an anime style background. The grass was the biggest challenge in this specific uh, one. The trees you can see here were done with the tree method I did a tutorial on a while ago. Also find that in the description. As you can see in the grass over here, I did not apply any kind of ambient occlusion in post-processing. I did not apply any kind of funny environment lighting. This had just general environment lighting. So you can certainly apply it without any fancy manipulation of your background. You can keep it as clean as when it got rendered. So let's put that on 0.5 again because I like the contrast. So the grass setup itself looks like this. It's not very fancy. I, I try to keep to a low number of particles, individual particles, and add a lot of children particles because the children particles also allow you to have kind of a roughness, as you can see over here where it looks like it's almost like stacked because that's the way you paint it. You paint it from the back forward and it's stacked. So it helps, yay. Uh, the length is also something I only adjust relative to the object, but I do try to apply the scale of the object before adjusting this. In this case, I have five segments. Usually I take this down to one, but as you can see, five segments really turned out to be a great move. I don't use hair dynamics. What I do is I use a texture, uh, set to an empty, and that I pull through. You can see the empty down here. And as that goes through, the grass kind of shakes with it. I do think that the texture can use a little bit of refinement because I feel the grass is kind of rubbery in a way. It's kind of too stiff. I uh, could use that bee spleen spline feature to even it out or something along those lines. As you can see, I just offset it and it's influencing the rough. Now the only way it can influence the rough is if you have any rough for it to influence, which we'll get to right now. So as you can see I keep the emitter. That's only if you're not using like super super dense grass. In the music video I didn't have the emitter active because I wanted to go for a more surreal kind of situation. 
So I use path and I use strand render. Strand render allows you to do a lot more in Blender render because it's not mesh based. It's kind of drawn afterward, even though the masks and the shadows and all that kind of stuff interact with it. But it does not receive shadows. Oh, no, no, it doesn't cast shadows. It does receive shadows, but it doesn't cast shadows. Was that that backwards? So strand render, I keep these settings default. Sometimes I tick be spline, spline or spleen, whatever you say that. But it doesn't make any visual difference, at least not for me. So of course you display your rendered, and then we get to the children particles. Now on my computer, at least on my previous computer, I could push the render to about 700, even with a very high particle count at the top. But I would not recommend that because it can slow your renders down, especially if you have like a full set like this. This took, just because it's grass alone, it took 12 seconds to render because this is all that's in the scene. But let's say you don't have the grass turned on and you render it out. This is what you get. Two seconds. So just give you an idea for of uh, how long it takes. Yeah, this is kind of an issue with the viewport, so don't be surprised if you turn it off and it turns back on. It don't. Don't be surprised. I think it's because the, this new feature is kind of still buggy. So if anyone wants to report that, you can go right ahead. But considering everything is going into the new version 2.8, I don't think it will be even worth it. <laughs> anyway, getting back on point. So on the, the roughness, I kept it uniform, but I changed the endpoint to 1.602, the random to 0.48, the size is still 1, I don't know what the default is on that, I think it is 1, threshold 0, I do change the kind of length threshold thing over here, what that does is it gives you uneven height based on the original particle versus your children particles, giving you these kind of little mountain kind of appearance, which I really, really like. I don't touch the parting stuff because I haven't seen any kind of visual difference with it. I don't know how that works. Maybe it's me, maybe it's not, I don't know. And then clumping, of course, what I do is I, I kind of center it on the bottom and coming out like a little fountain, not very intensely. So just to create a little bit of shape. So you can do that. And I don't use kink. I have used it in the past. I do think it's a cool feature. But for this kind of grass, this little short kind of field grass, meadow grass, it's really not necessary, so I just leave it off. It does give you a little bit more control in regards to your textures. Let me just show you. Because you can change both the amplitude and the frequency. In this case, you can just adjust the rough, whether it be rough or not rough. Which can kind of add to that rubbery kind of feel. Yeah, that's good. So when you want to render this out, like I just showed you guys, you need to make sure that strand is on, otherwise it's not going to show up. You don't need the Z-Pass, I'm just going to turn that off. You do need environment lighting to be on if you want it on, your physical shape. You do need it to be smooth. If it's not smooth, you're not going to be able to get that nice black in between the grass which you can set up like this. I just use a distance of 10, that's my default. Sample of 5, adaptive QMC, uh, it's adaptive so it's faster. Uh, threshold on 1, so that it goes for the absolute minimum samples that it needs visually. It does make a difference, it absolutely does. Okay, then you go back to your render layer stuff, okay. Don't need halo, so I'm just going to turn that off as well. We don't have any transparency in the scene, so I'm going to turn that off too. Remember, you turn off everything that you don't need, so that's absolutely as fast as possible. I do leave the environment lighting turned on. And I also have my fake environment lighting also turned on. You know, those six semi lights I talked about in the previous video. But I did set them to a higher setting. I set them to be 0.1 instead of 0.075. Just a heads up on that. So getting back to the world settings, just 0.25, white, and that's pretty much it. So when you render this out with the particles showing, 
Then you can go into your node editor. Just going to close that. Ah, you see, see, it fixed itself. Let me show you. See, that's the way it's supposed to look in the viewport. It's not supposed to show all the children particles. So that's a quick fix. You know, just go like this and then it will work. So let's close that because we don't need that at the moment. So it's a very simple setup. I set my material for my grass to be pass number seven. I didn't say material index. You have to have material index turned on for this. So I want to show you what the environment pass looks like. It's got a black background. Now this will be our darker areas. As you can see, it goes darker as it recedes into the grass. But we have a problem. I want to show you quickly what the problem is. If you take your ID mask, set it to 7, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and you turn on anti-aliasing, it looks fine initially until you use it as a mask. So I'm just going to take that out and make this black, like that. And I'm going to put this back in. Let's make it's kind of a blue color. Look at that. You can see it forms a little bit of a rim around the grass edges. It may not look like it makes a big difference, but when you apply your environment lighting and you multiply it, you get a black outline on your grass. That's what you get. You get this little black fringe. So you have to get rid of that. The only way to get rid of that is to blur it, as far as I know. You might want to might be able to switch to a different pixel filter. In this case, I'm not using Tint. I'm just using Mitchell, Nit, Trevally, however you want to say that. And I'm going to set this to 0.25, or make it 0.5. We've got to give it a little bit of strength. And then we take our ID mask, put it into the viewer, and we have to multiply this over itself. and stick that as the factor and go back there. And then you have a nice soft edge to it. However, 0.5 is a little too much. So I'm just gonna shrink that down and multiply this by two. Let's go for three. And just clamp it. 0.6, yeah, 0.6 is better. Just, just go by whatever works for your specific scene. Now this looks pretty. Just gonna open this. Oh, the way I zoom in and out is by pressing V, just V to um, zoom out, and Alt V to zoom in. So V to zoom out, Alt V to zoom in. And middle mouse button to move this around and Alt, middle mouse button to move this around. Press middle mouse button to move this. Just Alt and middle mouse button to move the background. Okay. In this case, it would mean Alt as an alternative. That's awesome. Okay, now we can add a color ramp because we need to make this a little bit more stark in terms of its contrast. So you can just set that to ease and bring that up, not too far. Just want to add a little bit of uneven contrast to our image. And then we multiply that over the original. Not mix it. There we go. And we need to blur it slightly because it's supposed to represent almost like a watercolor paint over effect. So go for, I think I used one. Yeah, I used one and clamp that of course as well. You do have the option to change the black to a more reddish brown color, that might be your thing. So you can, there's, there's barely any visual difference between the color one and the black one. If you wanna add a color, just go right ahead. So I just wanna turn this down a little bit more and compare it with the original. Okay, now if you take it off, put it on, Take it off, put it on. Makes a big difference in your final result. 
And that's pretty much it. That's how you set it up. The only thing I didn't show you guys was the actual strand settings of the material. So I'm going to show you that quickly before I forget. Uh, it's under strand. I always switch it to Blender units. If you don't, it uses pixel size on the screen. I use a root of 0.05 in this case so that it's nice and thick. The tip is always as small as Blender will allow me so that you can get that spiky kind of look. And the shape is at 0.9. Because I want it to be kind of round, it, it rounds to the tip. That's what happens when you give it a larger positive value. I want to see what the maximum value is. I'm just kind of curious about that. Let's go 500. Oh, 0.9 is the max. Ha! Ah, go figure. So you set it to the max, and of course your pass index, so that you can separate it out. And of course, receive transparent shadows. I turned off auto ray bias. Don't have to, but I did. And of course, it has to cast shadows. Now it's not going to cast shadows the strands themselves. The strands themselves, themselves. But the emitter can. So, so just a heads up on that. And that is it for the grass. Now I'm going to go back to the music video. This is the result I got. You can see here that it's nice and round. You can see the highlights. The only thing I didn't show you guys was that I just use a noise texture to get some variation in the grass. But you have to make the noise texture a lot larger than it would appear on the the material alone for it to be visible on the grass in a nice way. So just, again, work with it as you see fit. And I used overlay instead of multiply so that we can get some more reddish tones in here as well. Okay. This is why I brought us back to the music video. You remember I did in the, I think it was in the first video, I talked about the 10th plague, uh, the death of the firstborn, and how I'm still kind of looking for a way to show God's presence. Now, in this case, it does represent God's presence. And I really like the look of this, specifically. I do want to have a longer tail, but this can work for it. Um, I do think that this is at least in its current form, a little bit too, uh, what's the word? It's not majestic enough. Uh, I don't know how, if there is even a, a way to truly show how majestic God is in a, in a video form, but I do like the way this looks. So I'm still on the fence about it, but this is definitely something worth considering. And it even composites well. The only thing that I do notice is that it has kind of like a bright spot at the end. But, yeah. This is still not the absolute final look for the 10th plague. Might even go for something completely different. I don't know. I'm, I'm still waiting on God to show me what to do for it. Okay. So now back on to the normal procedure for the Exodus project. I told you guys last week that I was going to try to get to testing fire. And I actually got to that. So praise God. Ooh, so awesome. And this, this particular one is not the final test I did. But it is one of the um, fire tests. And I actually am going to stick to this method specifically. I still want to kind of figure out how to apply this when the camera is not like level on the ground, when the camera is like far away, coming in and, you know, you see the whole field on fire and all that kind of stuff. Still want to work on that. But at the moment, for ground level, since the fire is probably not going to be active for very long since there was rain and hail, it it may not even be necessary to to figure out like a really far angle because you're not going to coming far for fire that's not really going to show much and there's not even going to be much of smoke because the fire is going to be put out way too fast so we can add a little bit of smoke there but like i said it's not going to last very long so i'm just going to show you the fire 
you can see it's very short. Uh, that, that's a particle error. <laughs> I don't know why Blender did that. Okay, I'm going to switch to a longer example so it can play and I can just uh, keep rewinding it. Okay, so this was the second test. And this one I really, really like because it it's number one, longer, and number two, um, God showed me how I can get the fire particles to shrink really fast. So I can still have large particles here at the bottom, but smaller particles for like the little bits and pieces of grass that, or well not grass, the, the harvest, that burns off and kind of floats away as little embers. That's very cool. Um, I put a link in the description for the video that I saw at least somewhat of this method from. So I want to give credit where credit is due. It's not based on, I think he released a book on how to do these kinds of things in 3D. I don't have the book because I can't read Japanese. But you can certainly gain a lot of inspiration from the way that he has done things and shown how he has done things, which is really, really awesome. Now, as you can see, there's not much interaction between the grass and the fire. I think it's going to be too short anyway. But what I do want to say is the method I followed is one I've seen in a few shows, but I, it, it's been very long ago since I've seen any kind of show with this kind of fire in it. It's not something you see very often, at least not what I can remember. Uh, what they do is they mask the fire out, so they don't really animate the fire specifically. They, they animate the outline, the silhouette of it. And then they replace that silhouette with something in the line of a video screen tone, for, uh, for lack of a better term, it's the best way I can describe it, that usually looks like water or lava or something along those lines. You do get other animated fire that looks almost like water, except it's red and more pointy. And, you know, all sorts of other stuff. So this is the method that I, I went for, the whole screen tone kind of masking out thing. And I really am super ecstatic with the results of it. I do want to show you guys how I set it up, but um, you're going to have to bear with me because it is rather complicated. <laughs> <laughs> not, in, not, in, not in concept, but definitely in execution. Okay, so here we are in the project itself. As you can see, if you press play, boom. Obviously, I use children particles in this as well, because you do want to be able to multiply the amount on screen without crashing your computer. And children particles make it a lot easier for the computer to process it. So the fire particle looks like this. It's just a plane that's been subdivided twice, or well, not subdivided, loop cut twice. So I'm going to show you how that works. Just add two loop cuts, add two loop cuts, it's proportional editing, pull this down, and pull these up. And there you go, just make it smooth and squish it a little bit. It's as easy as that. And of course you have to add a material to it, but this material doesn't make a difference. So what I did do is I used the material for the fire particles so that I can separate it out. I have to mask it out. So I set it to two. Full oversampling as usual. Shadows, it's not going to receive shadows. I mean, I've never seen a shadow on fire. I I have seen that certain fires do cast shadows, really clear shadows, but since it's generally a light source, it doesn't really cast shadows. The light that goes against it has to be a lot brighter. So how this is set up is quite a story, but I'm going to summarize it for you guys by saying that Let's say Suzanne, this little Suzanne monkey over here represents our fire in the compositor. And she is upright, like that. 
Now, a fire has a tendency to fade out as it goes to the top. As it cools down, the color goes down. Uh, it starts with a brilliant white, because white's one of the hottest colors, and then it goes to red and black for the smoke. At the top of the fire, I wanted it to be red, as well as the lines that go across it. You know, that video screen tone I talked about. So all I did was use the mask after blurring it and using a constant color ramp, and I moved it down a little bit. And I mean very, very little bit. So that this bottom one would be our screen tone, and the rest would just be a flat red. So I'm going to show you what that looks like in the compositor. There you go, that's what it looks like in the compositor. This is our red area that's been, I think this is before it, just before it moves. No, and the movement is over here. So what I did was I finished this screen tone area as well before moving it down so that we have the red isolated. So you can see over here, this is after it's been moved down. See? Like a red mask over it. Let me show you the actual mask. There you go. See, you can see it's set to 2. It's blurred a little bit. Set to constant have our mask. I don't know why I have it twice. Maybe I switched it around, I don't know. And then it's slightly blurred again, before moved, and why did I blur it so many times? Goodness, it's weird. And then set to constant again, and we get the final mask. Now the screen tone itself is very simple. I used two cloud textures, not two cloud textures, one distorted noise, and one cloud texture set to go to two color ramps. The one is set as a mask so that we can change our distorted noise texture. Let me show you the distorted noise texture. Uh, there we go. This is our distorted noise texture. I want to show you the texture alone. There you go. That's the distorted noise texture. And when you add the screen tone to it, which is this one, just a, a squeezed cloud texture that's moving from the bottom to the top. It's really not complicated. All you need to do is just make it orange and yellow. And then you put that together with a red distorted noise, which I use the mask to create, like that. And then you have your basic screen tone, but we do need to break this up a little bit, otherwise it's too strong. It looks too... Uh, for lack of a better term, watery. So that's why I used a second cloud to, to just kind of mask it out, so that it's only on the darker areas, as you can see over here. And this all just moves up and a little bit backwards so that the form of the texture changes. So if you want to, you can render this out by default and just use this on whatever fires or whatever you're going to be using in the future as a screen tone. And of course you have to blur this thing almost endlessly before going into the final mask. And when you put it into the final mask, you're going to blur it again to get the outward glow. Fire is not typically super, super clear in its distortions. So this is our final fire before it gets blurred. Then we get our first level of blurring just to kind of soften it up. And uh, the overlay I did use over here is with the Z-Pass. The Z-Pass enables you to create kind of depth in your fire so that the most backward fire in the distance would be slightly darker than the fire that's like really close to the camera. So I just overlaid that so that only the dark areas would be affected. You can see I have a neutral gray over here. Now, I don't know if there's really a strong visual difference for it. I did notice one, especially at the top. It's kind of like the backfire goes... Backfire. 
<laughs> it's kind of like the fire at the back goes and breaks up into the red a little faster. Just going to show you what I mean by that. Okay, so I set it to 1.8, taking it down. You see what I mean? It breaks up faster. So if you go 1.8, it, it just gets into that red a little bit more gradually, but you still have the, the kind of sharp mask at the end. So I'm going to move on to the next area, which is setting up the blur. So it's, again, just isolating it. And then you blur as if it's going to go out of style. And you add that. And you blur it again, and you add that. And that's pretty much it. It's really, really not that complicated. But what I do want to say is that you do need to make sure you do have a lot of these little embers, at least initially. If you're burning anything of large number, like grass or wheat or any kind of harvest type of thing or meadow or whatever you use in your projects. Now what I also did uh, is do a quick test for the hail and the rain, and I'm going to show you that right now. So this is what the hail and the rain looks like together with the fire. As you can see, it's quite busy, and the rain and the hail would put the fire out uh, almost immediately. So going for that really distant kind of look is really kind of pointless. I would not recommend you do that. I want to quickly show you how I set up the particles for the fire in case you were wondering how to set up this kind of movement. So back inside our fire particles, I used about 30,000 because you do need a lot. I made it to stretch um, the length of the animation because it's going to start at the start of the animation. If you want the fire to already be going, you know, having its momentum, whatever you set your lifetime to, give yourself that much of a buffer um, before because that's how long it's going to take your fire to start and go out. So that's pretty much a guarantee that this is going to be the maximum of your fire. That's the amount of frames that you need. So I do that. Okay, and of course you bake it. I set it to a cache step of 4. I had some issues before, so I tried to reconfigure it. It's usually set to 10. I think you can leave it at 10. Just go nuts, taste it. I did use normal geometry, which means that if you have a surface like this, it's going to slightly adjust the trajectory the trajectory wah, of your fire particles. I did set it to go up faster, and I did set it to go to the side faster, because usually when a storm comes up, it's kind of preceded by wind, which brings the clouds and all that kind of stuff. So the fire would go up, and it would go along the y-axis. So you can use your global little gimbal over here to understand which way it's going to go. Z value is up, positive. Y value is this way, positive. But I do believe that it could be um, linked to the emitter object's normals. So just, again, test it, see what happens, and configure as you see fit. Adding a little randomness to the trajectory again. Not a lot. You're, you're barely going to notice it, but it does make a difference. Rotation, definitely required. Otherwise, you just have these static little chunks going up. So I used a random value, a very random value for velocity. This is actually just your velocity speed, the, the speed at which it turns. Of course, adding a little phase to it. The phase is the initial rotation of your particle object. In other words, is the cube upright? Is it slightly tilted? Is it tilted a lot? You know, that sort of tilt is your phase. And the randomness is how randomly are your objects going to be rotated when they start out. And of course, dynamics says that it's going to have to change as it happens. Of course, the physics, I never adjust these settings unless I have a really good reason to, like with the expressive elements. Link in the description for that tutorial. And of course, our render. I do keep the emitter because we do need our field. 
uh, add rotation to this. Uh, you don't have to. Again, you, you just work with visual cues. You, you really have to just work with visual cues. Uh, display, I always use rendered. And on children particles, I just used 10 children particles per single flame particle. Of course, I changed the size, the random and the size. The reason I changed the random and size is so that you don't have like little balls of um, fire particles. It, it looks really weird. I want to show you what it looks like if you change that. Okay, so we can only see one displayed over here, so I'm going to set it to 10. So let's set this back to size of 0 or of 1, no randomness, uniformity, uniformity, and let me see if I can change the endpoint to 0. Yeah, I can change it to 0. Obviously, no shape. Uniform to nothing. And... I think this would also, no, that would be at least on one. So this is what you get if you just turn on children particles on simple. See, you, you really, really, really need to adjust all these things. Otherwise, you just get these little weird clumps. I did, however, apply two textures. So I'm just going to turn off the children particles so I can show you. One is for density. As you can see, these areas have no particles applied to them, like that. What I did add also was a scale, so that when it goes up, it shrinks rather rapidly, like that, see? It's just a linear texture with a Achablain texture, and of course the density one is just a cloud texture. The scale one, I applied using the strand and particle coordinates. I find that um, it works better. I'm, I'm going to add a link in the description to the tutorial where I saw this on. It just prevents all that weird flickering um, I talked about in the explosion tutorial as well, explosion cloud tutorial. It's more of a dust cloud, but you get the point. You can use it for whatever and it's just set to affect the size. You can also animate these sliders and stuff, but I, I tend to avoid doing that with procedural textures because it can work when you first run through the animation, but as soon as you try to bake it, it just does not affect it at all. And of course, density is uh, set to, I think, generated, yeah, and customly adjusted to be visible. Also set to just density, not size. Okay, that is it for the fire particles. Now I get to show you the hail. Okay, so the hail kind of took me a while as well. But in order to show you that, I'm just going to have to turn off the rain first. So let's turn off the rain. Just want to make sure that the fire is turned off. Okay, the fire is turned off. So when you play back the hail, you get this. You can see that kind of hit the ground and they bounce a little bit and then they roll and stop. Uh, from the hail I've seen in my lifetime, this is very accurate physically, at least what I can remember. And I want to show you how to set this up too. All I did was use a single object for a hailstone, just a cube sphere with a little bit of roughness added to it. There you can see it just has a tune material, so that's nice and white, strong white. And of course, pass indexed so that I can add some motion blur to it like you guys saw in the video, which I might take out, kind of overpowers the view. Anyway, getting back on point. So hail and rain is set to a different plane at the top. You can't have it coming from the ground. So the hail, I set it to 25,000 particles because they're not going to last very long. So they don't drag your performance down as you might think they would. Very short lifetime, only 60 frames. Uh, in frame 300, again, the length of the animation because the hail starts at the start of the animation. So you don't have to only get it active first. 
Cache tape set on one for accuracy. A velocity. Again, it has to be at an angle. Let's say the wind is blowing like really hard. It has to be at an angle. And of course, our speed downward. No normal speed was uh, used on this. No random speeds either. Of course, physics, again, left as per default. I did turn off the emitter, and I made sure that dead particles still show. Otherwise, the, um, the hail would just disappear. Let me show you. Now, when hail hits the ground, it has to have a slight bounce to it. Now, ice is, is not known for its bouncy properties. Usually it just cracks when you drop it. But it does have a small bounce to it. In order to get that little bounce, you have to adjust these little settings over here. Now, some particles of hail will bounce higher than others, so you do need a random value. And they don't really roll very far, especially not on ground, since they're kind of wet. And the way that mud works, it it kind of prevents it from rolling around. It's not like a little rubber ball. It's, it's, it's almost sticky. I don't know how else to describe it. So you have to have extremely strong particle dampening so that it doesn't bounce like all over the place. And your particle friction has to be very high so that it doesn't roll all over the place. So you set those to absolute max. I do set this to a lower value so that the particle is as, as tight to the ground as possible. And of course, you do add a little bit of a randomness so that it some do bounce, some don't, that sort of thing. One thing I didn't mention is that for the physics, I did turn on size deflect, and that enabled the hail to actually sit on the ground. Just a hint there. Otherwise, it kind of sinks into the ground. OK, that is cool. I didn't add any kind of randomness to the sizes of the hail. You can add that. It will add a little bit of more dimension to it. But since we have this great level of distance, you don't need it. The rain, on the other hand, OK, I used slightly blue kind of material, as you can see over here, which gives it kind of an icy look. And it also makes it a little bit darker. Otherwise, it's, it's just too white. I don't know how else to describe it. It's just too white. Uh, you do need to change its strand settings because when you use the tail uh, trail kind of settings of your particles, you it uses the strand settings. So I use the kind of strong root. The tip, again, I just make it zero and blender units. For rain, if you do use rain and you don't want closer droplets to be a different size than the distant droplets, you can turn off Blender units and use the pixel setting. This is one setting where you can actually use that. Praise God for showing me that right now. Okay, I did add some randomness to this. So let me show you that quickly. I set that under the, the velocity stuff. I didn't use the normals, but I did use slight rotation, object over here and random over there. I found that when I set it above one, the randomness was too intense. Setting it below one, the randomness wasn't enough. So in this case, one worked brilliantly. I did add a little bit of a rotation, but I didn't see a visual difference. Of course, the Y speed has to be really fast. So it's set to um, eight, so that it gets quite a good angle. And the downward speed has to be really fast, so that's it to minus 20. A little bit of rotation so that it's angular. Not that this really made much of a difference, but whatever. At least for the rain, it didn't make much of a difference. And now the important part is our render settings. Now, in this case, we don't want our emitter to show because it's going to create this big flat shadow on the ground, big square flat shadow. So I turned that off for both the hail and the rain. It's, it's falling from the sky. I mean, it's, yeah. So it, I used the tail one, set it to speed. So the faster it goes, the longer the tail will be. Simple as that. Trail count one, head zero. 
and it's set to line, not path, it's set to line. And of course the default material that is on our shape. So if you rename this rain color, which is uh, shadeless by the way, and you go back into your particles, you can see it's exactly that material. Okay, display, fine, children, none, field weights, none. Uh, one thing I do need to mention is for the hail, I actually did have to add gravity. When I didn't have gravity, they wouldn't um, just bounce and settle back on the ground. They would kind of go up. If you don't have gravity turned on, it is going to bite you. So just leave the field weights alone for the hail, and you'll be fine. And that is pretty much it for this little section of the fire. Now what I do want to show you guys is uh, um, this week's first image. Um, boom. Oh yeah. Now this is where God used Moses to part the Red Sea and the Israelites could go um, straight through. The verse, well, not verse, but <laughs> the section came from uh, Hebrews 11, as you can see at the bottom of the screen. But this scene took me at least the whole morning to to put together. I used the, the cliff face from the caustics I told you guys about, which I want to show you a texture, a better texture of. And the water took a while, but that was not the difficult part. The difficult part was the foam that kind of um, comes from the friction with the rocks. Uh, I know that the Prince of Egypt is a great example of how that kind of foam can be drawn over 3D elements, which is just absolutely stunningly well done. But, um, yeah, this turned out extraordinarily well. I'm super thankful God showed me how to produce this. As you can see over here, I used a different caustics texture, and that's exactly what I'm going to be showing you guys right now. And that is a better texture for caustics, if you are looking for one. Uh, in the caustics tutorial, I told you guys that uh, God had not yet revealed to me a better texture, but after the day after I posted the video for it, that morning at 3 o'clock, um, I woke up and I was like, God, why am I awake at 3 o'clock in the morning? Was I supposed to pray about something or whatever? And he just said no. And then... I, w I would say it's less than 10 seconds later he showed me how to produce this texture and I quickly wrote it down on my phone. So I'm going to show you guys how to make this texture. It's purely distorted noise, but it enables you to get this really sharp caustic texture. The other ones I used are still great. It just depends on what you need. If you're doing a, a very shallow pool or if you're doing... Um, uh, like a, an aquarium type situation, you're going to need a, a much sharper texture. If you're going to do deep, deeper sea kind of stuff, let's say somebody's diving deeper and deeper, you're going to need a much softer texture, and this texture does not do soft. So this is purely another option, but it is absolutely amazing. I mean, look at how it deforms on shapes that are rounded. It's just absolutely stunning, absolutely stunning. So I'm going to show you how to put this together. Now the compositing didn't change. The way that it's applied didn't change. The only thing that did change is our texture. The texture we use is distorted noise. Again, you still use a color to define it. Very sharp to get it as thin as possible. Um, but you use a Voronoi crackle texture. You know that really, uh, it almost looks like a mosaic a cracked mosaic kind of look and you distort it using the improved Perlin one or the Blender original one. You can pick between whichever one you think looks the best. And you set distortion to 0.5. Anything from 0.3 to 0.5 gives you a good result. And of course the size doesn't matter. And I set it again to the empty, added it as a stronger light source So that is it for this vlog. I hope this new texture is of great value to you. I hope you can use the fire technique I showed you guys. Again, links in the description to the tutorials and all sorts of other cool stuff. 
and have a great one and God bless.